So we have, uh, we're gonna go on a journey this morning. So we're gonna talk a little bit about 3D archeology span in general and some different techniques you can use, but then we're gonna hammer down and go through um, a photogrammetry workflow. And we have a data set for you to download and we have tested the data set. So it should work out perfect for you and you should be able to get a nice 3D object. Um, so I think Emma put the link to that in the chat box, but we can make sure we can repost it if anyone missed it. Um, it's a cool stone tool from Seminole County. So, um, so digital heritage is kind of this big growing field and it involves um, all sorts of different aspects. So creating 3D models of real life things or you know, creating 3D reconstructions of things. And um, there's a lot of cool aspects to this because, um, because it's all on computers, you can share a lot of data really quickly and easily um, in ways that you can't uh, in more traditional ways. So you can create like a data, uh, uh, and a, you can digitize an assemblage of artifacts and share it with colleagues all over the world easier than trying to ship things around or move people in to come look at your stuff. Um, and you can do some very basic uh, analysis of those artifacts based on the models. So um, just some research outputs with this, you can create precise measurable site or artifact data. Um, and so, as I say, that's really great because you can be able to measure, to um, track things like erosion if you kind of get multiple scans of shorelines um, and be able to send things around. Uh, you can get orthomosaic images. So even if people can't quite look at 3D images, you can still get like, this is really great for building architecture because you can do a bunch of scans and very easily do uh, Habs hair documentation based off of the scans. Um, we are using it for what we're calling catch and release artifact documentation. So we, um, when we go out and monitor, you know, we don't want to collect everything. Uh, we don't want to collect anything really. So we can, um, you know, photograph and create the 3D model of the artifact and be able to leave it at the site um, and not have to curate it. But we have the data that we, you know, we're getting uh, from the models and the models that we can be able to go through and, as I say, do some basic analysis of the artifacts um, without curating things. Uh, documentation of threatened resources is a lot of what we're doing here. So um, we've scanned buildings that were been demolished. We're scanning shorelines that are eroding away. We are um, using this as a tool for tracking things, but also just of kind of documenting what's here, what it looked like maybe before or after storms, things like that. Um, as I said, documentation of changes of a site through time. Uh, and then you can share this data very easily, uh, pretty widely too, which is cool. And then, of course, we love it because it has all sorts of public application as well. So um, you can create virtual exhibits. You can use it for virtual or augmented reality. Um, we do a lot of 3D printing of the artifacts that we scan as well because it's great. You can hand them out to all of the fourth graders and not worry that they're going to break uh, bone or pottery or fragile things or even to be able to have, um, you know, re replicas of artifacts that can't be passed around to anyone, right, that are very fragile that really need to kind of stay in a curation facility or, or stay. Uh, stay locked away. Um, this kind of liberates them and lets you uh, get them out in the world. Uh, and then, uh, once again, you know, printing these objects, you can do uh, exhibits of models. So Emma worked with Noah and the, the Florida Keys Sanctuary and um, did an exhibit of 3D printed artifacts from a shipwreck because it's not great great conditions to keep things um, in museums down in the Keys where it's hot and muggy. Um, so it's much easier to keep 3D printed artifacts on display and then you don't have to worry about uh, the actual objects. So um, really cool applications there. Uh, tons of more applications. These are just some of the things that we thought of uh, off the top of our head, but lots of, lots of cool people doing lots of cool things with this. Um, just to touch on some vocabulary, because uh, we will get 40 minutes into talking to somebody and they're like, what's a point cloud? So uh, right off the bat, um, a point cloud is the individual points of data. So um, one analogy that we use, especially when we're talking about terrestrial laser scanning is a total station takes one point of data um, and the laser scanner takes like thousands of points of data. So uh, a point cloud is just all of these points of data that are kind of put together into where they are spatially. Um, and then when you mesh something, you connect all of the dots. So in its rawest form, any of this data is just the point cloud. Um, and it's when you start connecting the dots that you start interpreting the data. Um, so point clouds versus mesh. And then there's also geometry versus texture. So geometry is the geometry. It is the shape of the object. It is that mesh. It is that 3D model that you're creating. Um, but the texture is where you put the images in it. And the texture files actually are these crazy JPEGs uh, that look like this that are all like flattened and unwrapped. Uh, and there's another file type that helps you put it, figure out how to put it all together. 
um, in places. So it's important to make sure you get all of the files when you export and move things around. Um, otherwise, they don't go back together. But um, you can actually edit the texture in places like Photoshop if you're really, really savvy with those programs and um, do cool things with that separate from the model. Um, so some methods that we use, this is by no means all of the methods you can use to create uh, 3D models and, and print models and th stuff, but some of the methods that we use um, are it's laser scanning. Um, and as I say, you know, this is uh, in contrast to the total station taking one point, it's taking all sorts of points and it acts, um, you know, it's a laser, so it's going to travel to where it hits something firm and then come back and give that data. So you can kind of see the image here where there's all these little red dots that are the lasers going out and it can't see behind this column, right? It can only see the column. So it's not getting any data from behind it, but it is getting data off of that column there. Um, the, a lot of laser scanners, you can't actually see the laser, which is nice because then you don't have to worry about getting blended with crazy lights. Um, and the basic workflow with this is, you know, you, you take the scans and then you have to figure out how all the scans fit together. Uh, and then you refine the data and can create whatever outputs you want. Um, the lasers only get the geometry, um, so you often will pair with the photos to get the texture. Um, and so the laser, a lot of the laser scanners will get all of that data for you and kind of pair it together so you don't have to worry about it. Um, one cool thing about the, the, the laser scanner is it creates the scaled, the models scaled already. So it knows exactly how big things are in real life. Um, and it can be very precise uh, and very accurate. So that's really great. But the downside is it does require some special equipment, uh, so it can get really expensive to get into the laser scanning world. Um, we have uh, a small laser scanner that we use for artifacts. Um, this is a next engine scanner, and this one does have colored lasers, but um, it does very tiny objects, and it has a, a program that stitches all of the scans together and applies the texture. Um, but we also use a terrestrial laser scanner for big sites, big landscapes, um, bigger objects. So we have a Faro Focus that we use um, and we've traveled all over the state to get big landscapes with that or bigger objects like our Bridge of Lions line. Um, and this is one tool that we're using in documenting uh, shoreline erosion. So um, some preliminary scans here of Shell Bluff Landing, but you know, you're able to get kind of this whole landscape um, and in theory through time, you can kind of stack the models and then track how the, the site's changing and get, you know, uh, Geometric, that's uh, get like qualitative numbers, quantitative numbers on how much the site is changing, what the erosion is. Uh, it's still it's still morning, and I have lost my coffee, so pardon my brain there. Um, you can do really big landscapes. So the University of South Florida scanned the entire Castillo de San Marcos inside and out, every single room, um, and that was a really cool project because they learned a lot about the Hort that. They, you know, they thought they knew what it looked like, and they thought they knew what the layout was, and and um, they had all these blueprints, and they found a lot of things that didn't quite match up, and some weird pockets of space that they didn't realize were there. Um, so that was a really cool project, but it's in like you know centimeter accuracy of the whole the whole site. So um, cool applications there. Um, something that you could do, should you have uh, a light, uh, iPhone 12 Pro, is there's this really cool app. Um, the phone actually has LiDAR. The 12 Pros have LiDAR now, which is crazy. Um, so there's this app called 3D Scanner app, and it does pretty good models, as far as we can tell, for, you know, kind of quick, uh, quick things. Um, so you turn it on and you hit go, and you just kind of walk around the object or, you know, over and under and around. Um, and it'll tell you, like it'll show you, you know, where it's scanned and where it hasn't. And then you can actually export it from your phone um, and put it into other programs that we'll talk about, you know, to put on Sketchfab or to clean it up or to print it or things like that. Um, and it also has this really cool virtual reality feature. So Sarah went on a whirlwind vacation out west and has brought back models of uh, car hinge that you can kind of throw out and walk around and hold your phone and, and see it all. Um, so it's kind of a cool tool too, you know, we did a bunch of headstones and you can throw them out on the ground and, and you know, it's it's scaled to how big they were in real life. So it gives you the, the sense of, of what it's like to be there. Um, we went to Fort Frederica. I'm going to go on a slight tangent here uh, just to talk about how cool virtual reality is, but we um, they got an app of re the, that has the reconstructed buildings there and to stand on the foundations and see, you know, where the structures are. And even for folks who are archaeologists who think that way, you know, we're like, oh yeah, structure, okay. But then to get the iPad and like hold it and you know, you're looking up and up and up and up at the building, it's like a whole different experience and you really can 
internalized like, oh, this was a big two story house and you know you have to walk all the way around it to see all the sides and how big it was. So um, there's some really cool things you can do with, with that. Um, so we're gonna focus now just on photogrammetry because this is a little bit uh, more you can get into doing photogrammetry for a little uh, less funds um, and it doesn't take any special equipment. Um, you know, you need a camera. We use our cell phones a lot for doing some, some quick and simple models uh, and the software, there's some free software. We use a software that is, uh, you can get it with an educational discount for $60. Um, so it's pretty inexpensive, all things considered. Um, and the basic workflow for this is you're going to take a bunch of photos and then you um, align the photos and that's what gets the geometry, which what creates the point cloud. Um, and then you can refine the data and go into outputs. Um, so the overlapping photos create the geometry and texture. Um, and so this is, you know, technology that goes way, way back. If you guys know about the stereoscopes, right? If you have two photos that are just off enough and you line it up correctly, your brain automatically kind of gives this 3D effect to it. It. And that's basically what you're doing in photogrammetry, except you have 100 photos and the computer is your brain. Um, so you want photos that have enough overlap so that, you know, you want them different, but but different enough, but not too different. So you can kind of see the, the, the difference here is only a, a few feet off uh, in some of these. Um, and this technology, um, you know, is used for those fun tour stereoscopes and all, but um, BLM really kind of spearheaded a lot of this in like USGS folks because um, they use this technology to create uh, topo maps and then you know going from two photos and, and getting kind of just the lines but then building it up into lots of photos and, and being able to map in bigger landscapes that way. Um, you do have to put the scale into this so the computer will figure out how all the photos align and what the geometry is but it doesn't know if it's a meter or 10 meters so you have to go and um, add that information and tell it that information and we'll show you some um, tools that you can use for that. Um, so you can do small objects. Uh, we do a lot of, you know, artifacts and there's a way to get it, you know, where it's 360 degrees of it and, um, you know, print it and have it kind of this, this free, like doesn't have a base or a stand or anything um, using the software. Um, we also use it for, you know, bigger objects or bigger landscapes. You just have to take more photos. Um, for some of the bigger landscapes, uh, you can use drones, the unmanned aerial ve vehicles, uh, and you can actually tell the drones to fly a certain flight pattern and take photos at certain increments. Uh, and then you can just hit go and it does all the work for you. And then um, you know, use the software to kind of splice it all together. So um, you can get really big landscapes and, and lots of data uh, very quickly that way and reach areas that you wouldn't be able to just hold in your camera. Um, so here's just an example of, uh, we did uh, at the same site, Shelbuff Landing, we did the well that was there with photogrammetry. And so um, just a fun, a fun little video. Um, and as I say, we do a lot of 3D printing of these art artifacts. And so that's um, kind of another, you know, this step three you can take if you're interested. Um, a lot of local libraries have printers, a lot of, um, Universities and institutions have printers like in engineering departments that you can often uh, go ask and get them to print things for you. Um, so that is that technology is uh, more available than you realize. You just have to get your models cleaned up and ready to go, and then they take take away. Um, so I'm going to let Emma talk for a few minutes, and we're going to go through uh, what we call in the round processing. So um, this is to get kind of a round shaped object to go around. If you wanted to model like the facade of a wall, there's some different techniques you can use. Um, but this is probably kind of the more applicable of what you might use uh, in archaeology. Yeah. Uh, so if you saw in the chat, there is a Google Drive that does have this exact data set that we're going to kind of work through. Um, and it does have, it has the photos and it has the workflow already printed out or in a uh, Word document. We're just going to kind of show through with some added little um, side information from us. Uh, so suggested programs, we use Agisoft Metashape, which you can get for a $60 educational license. We are not sponsored by Agisoft, but there are other um, open soft, open source uh, uh, resources out there. I think it's, what is it? Micmac. Micmac, and there's a few others that you can find. We've just been trained on Agisoft, and so we're kind of stuck with it. <laughs> um, there's also like reality capture. You can get a free educational license as well, and you can process data in that as well. You can also import 
uh, LIDAR or uh, laser scan data. So after that, you want to get into manipulating and post-processing these data, because if you have your point cloud and you make your mesh, uh, you can do more with it. So one of the major things that we do is we pop into Mesh Mixer, which Mesh Mixer, Mesh Lab, Cloud Compa Compare, and Blender are all free. They're open source. We use Mesh Mixer a lot uh, to make our models watertight for printing, so we don't have any sort of holes or um, dangly bits, dangly bits, or any sort of issues that are going to mess up with the printer that we might not see to our, you know, naked eye. And then printing. Kira is an open source software. Um, a lot of printers have their own integrated software, like. Um, MakerBot and even the resin printer now has its own proprietary software. So depending on how you go, there's different options for printing. I don't know how to work on that. Uh, so one of the first things when we're talking about uh, in the round processing or making a photogrammetric model of something small and in a circular motion is thinking about your object itself and really kind of considering your plan before going into uh, making your model. So what type of equipment do you need? Do you need to have a micro lens? Do you need to have your light box? Do you have access to a light box? Things like that. Get really planned to get your mindset and consider the items like or consider the geometry. So these are the shapes of the object. How many photos do you think you'll really need? Can you actually make a model out of this object? Is it completely flat? So, so you're going to target certain areas a little bit more. Uh, just really consider all of this. Also, just consider things before going into the field when you're doing landscapes as well. Just really think about your object. So your first major step and the most important part is taking the photos. Uh, you can take a whole crap load of photos and if they're not good, your model won't be good. So I have spent many hours trying to process data sets with crappy photos and have realized it would have been literally 20 minutes of my time to go retake the photos. So making sure that your photos are in focus, they're at the right intervals. So photogrammetry really wants that stereo, stereograph image, which is 60% overlap. So you wanna have each image has a minimum of 60% overlap. We take photos at about, is it 20? Well, 15 to 20. Oh, okay. One of them is 15 and the other one we have set up as at 20. Okay. Yes, so. Oh, oh, but still 60. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so taking photos at a 15 degree interval around your um, circle or in, around your turntable, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, at different angles. So like Emily Jane pointed out with the laser scan photo, your photo, if you're taking a straight on photo, you're not getting data at every angle you want. So making sure you get every angle of your object covered. And if you need to, you can flip your, your object over and do the same process again. Um, and like it says on the um, slide, if the camera can't see it, neither can the software. So uh, in the lab, some setups, uh, you can get the fancy uh, orange monkey uh, folio three table if you have a nice budget. Uh, it makes life a lot easier. Uh, it pops up, it's a light box, and it also has a turntable that will turn for you uh, through an app, all Bluetooth controlled. But at the same time, you don't need all the fancy equipment for this. If you need to have do this extremely cheap, you can just rotate your object um, 15 degrees or pick up a cheap uh, turntable at Walmart, Target, or somewhere and spin it each 15 degrees. So all you need to have is that small setup. So you can go as big and crazy as getting the whole setup or as easy as working on a turntable with lines. Oh, do you have a video? No. Oh. Um, in the field, just using what you have, uh, the photos from Fort Mose of Emily Jane yesterday, uh, going to town, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and thankfully, the ladder rig that they have had spacing enough that you can measure out your footprints as you walked along to photograph the shoreline. So you're able to take measured distances, um, but also throwing in things like scale bars so you can have geometry that you know exists in the shoreline. Yeah, our rule of thumb for like bigger objects in the field is you just kind of take like one hip distance step over for each round, for each 
to get the, the 15 degrees kind of yeah, so at the different type of pacing in the field. Uh, so for scaling, I'm going to let I mean, Emily Jane talk about this because I'm not great at scaling because I have not done it in a year or more. I don't know. So for scaling small objects that you're doing in the light box, you want to take all of your photos um, and then you can take um, kind of a second set of photos that have the scale in there. Um, and they can be a little more straightforward just to get a couple across um, that have the scale. So you need, need enough photos with the scale for it to figure out the geometry as it relates to the scale. Um, but then you can edit the scale bars out. And um, so there's a couple different ways you can do that so that the final object doesn't have the scale in it. And of course, if the object is here and the scale is here and you clean it to just have the object, you know, that's going to get rid of the scale. Um, so you can use, you know, simple photo scales, cards. Um, um, we use, you know, our, our photo scale cards for the smaller objects, um, and then we have some kind of fancier scale bars that we use in the field um, that help. Like they, they have, there's like an auto detect feature we'll talk about. Um, but even, even the photo scale bars, it can often find. Um, but these are nicer because they're bigger. So if you have a bigger landscape, um, you know, if you get photos further back, uh, you know, it's not going to pick that up as easily as it may. You know, one of these that's three meters long and has bigger dots on it. Um, but essentially, you know, a scale can really be anything you know the size of. So we've scaled with um, like wooden rulers or a pen. You just need to be able to measure the thing, the object that is the scale. Um, and we've also just measured the objects themselves and tried to scale that way to some mixed <laughs> results. Um, so, and I mean, you know, once again, it also comes down to like how good does your data need to be? So are you trying to um, you know, create a data set that you can email to people that they can actually get, you know, good archaeological information from the object, or are you just trying to create something that you can print and pass around to fourth graders? You know, it's, it's the scale of precision that you're, you're going with, so. Uh, these are Emma and MJ's hot tips, um, things that we have learned and picked up along the way. I cannot stress enough that the photos are everything. Uh, just if you have one shot to take with your photos uh, or one moment, no pun intended on that. Uh, if you have one moment where you need to get your photographs, you're not coming back out to the site, you don't have access to the collection anymore, make sure your photos are perfect. In focus, nothing's blurry. You didn't shake your hand as you took the photos uh, because that is your major set of data. Um, large depth of field is important, making sure everything is in focus. Uh, we also, this is when using a photo booth, I like this, is to slightly overexpose my photos because it tends to wash out the background a little bit better. Uh, and that just makes it whiter, brighter, and easier. Uh, that's all up to preference. Uh, ensuring your photos have enough overlap. There is a um, grids you can turn on your DLSR or even your iPhone or other phone. So you make sure you are lining up and get Getting that stereograph image. You don't need a ton of photos. Um, I've seen people who've taken thousands of photos of an object and you can take your photos as much as you need. So 200 photos is more than enough to get a point as you will see. I might even have too many photos, but the thing is you just need good photos. If you're out at a shoreline and you're concerned, you're not going to have good photos or something's going to go wrong take as many photos as you want that's fine it's just making sure like you have good photos and the more photos you dump into the software it's like the more data in the longer it takes to process so the like there's a sweet spot where you have enough photos of the right quality and it like optimizes your processing time um and that varies by what kind of object and the geometry so there's not like a gold number we can give you um yeah, uh, there's nothing like starting a project and seeing it say you need 16 hours of processing time <laughs> and then you just tied up your computer for the entire day. Um, the last thing is something I have learned one too many times. If you're in the middle of processing a data, you have Agisoft up and then you decide your desktop is looking a little cluttered and so you organize your desktop while things are going or even afterwards, um, Agisoft, I have not been able to find a way to relocate photos afterwards. Uh, so just don't move your photos from the folder it starts in. Keep yourself organized to the start. That is definitely an Emma hot tip. 
good data management. <laughs> And then, so we're getting into like the, the major steps of um, the actual software itself. So the first steps are that you align your photos. It's very simple in Agisoft. You'll see on the workflow, it really steps you right through. But aligning photos will give you your first set of data, your sparse cloud. And as you can see, all the blue rings around this object, they should be a little bit perfect, more spherical. But that is all the placements of the camera. So you can see every single image that I took and how it surrounds the object. And you really want that nice tight sphere of images. And that really shows that you have kind of gotten all your data set. You can technically see in this where there's a small band where I should have taken an extra set of photos, but did not. Uh, thankfully, it all goes together anyways. Uh, troubleshooting when aligning things, um, stuff happens. Uh, try, you can try processing in chunks. You'll, if you get into Agisoft, you'll see exactly what we mean. And we're also always here to chat with if you have questions. Uh, trying different uh, qualities, you can mask photos uh, to get rid of background noise. That's a whole other step. Uh, and reviewing your photos and deleting problematic ones. There might be a photo in there that has a slight shaky hand to it or it's blurry and just getting rid of those photos will help with resetting your alignments. Uh, your next step, you once you have your sparse cloud, you can clean it up. We do this by gradually selecting and optimizing your cameras, but then also just selecting. You'll notice if you work through this data set, the point was pushed down into a little bit of modeling um, putty so it could stay upright when we took the photos. But we also collect that data. That modeling putty is in our model, so you get to select and delete and take care of that. It's a pain in the butt. Masking would get rid of that, but I kind of like the tedious small time of getting to like be intimate with my data. So say you're you're cleaning it out in one step or another, unless you've taken the perfect set of photos, in which case it doesn't know. So another hot tip is don't take photos that include the modeling clay, because there's enough data if you take overlapping photos that it will figure out how it fits together without showing the tip that's stuck in the clay. Yeah, so you can crop that out um, when you're taking the photo. Uh, uh, for scaling, and there's just the steps at which you find the targets to create the points, uh, depending on what your scale is. If you have a, a thing with actual targets, which are these round points that literally tell you the sub sub millimeter distance, yeah. uh, or it can, it can find circles. It can find like the crosshair, like where the the black and white boxes meet. Um, so depending on what kind of scale you have in there, you can tell it to detect the markers, and it'll find it. Um, and if you don't have something like that, if you had, you know, like if you measured part of the site or you, you had some other measurement that you wanted to use, you can go in and manually add markers. Um, so you put markers in and then, you know, you need two markers to create a scale bar. And so um, all of this comes up in this reference bar frame and you can collect, you know, select two targets to become a scale bar. Um, and then you manually input the distance in between the two markers. Yep. And that's just to make everything um, accurate in the data. Uh, again, not not totally necessary all the time, especially if you're just making uh, a 3D printed model for somebody to ooh and all ah over. When you print models, you can tell them how big you want it to be. So you can change the site. You can scale the object in there that way as well. But if you have a scaled model and you put it into the printing software, it should come up like the actual size automatically. Uh, and then your next step is just to build that dense cloud point, uh, dense point cloud, uh, which is basically it takes your sparse cloud and makes it dense. Uh, it adds in more points. It's very simple. Um, software does it virtually automatically. Uh, and you'll see again on the workflow, there's some extra steps if you wanted to go that route. What's really nice about Adisoft is the workflow tier, the little um, menu. menu. There you go. Thank you won't allow you to go to the next step until you complete the correct step. So you can't jump ahead and build a dense point cloud unless you have a sparse cloud. You can't build your mesh unless you have this done, um, which I quite appreciate getting used to a software like that. Uh, you have to clean again. You're just going to have to do it, especially with this model. I apologize. Um, trying to find a really great data set that we created was a little bit harder than I thought. Well, we wanted something that would have a, a lower processing time too. So that was yes. 
finding something that would process on medium or low so your computers won't get bogged down if you're playing around with this was a little bit more complicated than anticipated. Also something that we could easily give away to people. This is an unconvenienced artifact um, that is now at the Seminole County Museum. So it was, they were completely okay with us using it for a um, workflow. Clean that up, easy, fun, check out your data. And then at this point, you are creating your mesh and your texture. And that's as simple as clicking some extra buttons. And Emily Jane talked earlier about um, exactly what mesh and texture looks like. You see, you can see what we have our connected dots and that texture applied to the model, which makes it look like the actual object itself. Uh, Post-processing, we talked about some extra softwares that could be used as Mesh Lab, Mesh Mixer, Cloud Compare, Cura, whatever you're going to be doing with your model, upload directly in Sketchfab, et cetera. These are just a software softwares that you can prepare your model for what you're planning to do, either sharing, printing, or whatever you want to do with it. Uh, uploading to Sketchfab, you may need to simplify your object depending on how large and detailed your model is, and that's just to get rid of a few extra faces uh, or vertexes. Um, you'll export your object from uh, Agisoft or whatever software you're using and you should get three files. You should get an OBJ, a JPEG, and an MTL. Your MTL is the metadata file that will tell how the OBJ and the JPEG fits together. You need to zip all those together and import it into Sketchfab. Uh, preparing models for printing. Your mesh needs to be watertight and have really straightforward geometry. No dangling bits, no hanging, um, or else you're just going to get a spaghetti monster of print material, either it's your um, PLA or even your resin is just going to be this cured glob at the bottom of your printer. Not fun to clean up. Um, more hot takes. Uh, and then your printing software you'll use to slice and to figure out the layers of the printing and be, you can edit and fine tune that in your softwares. Uh, I, this is the end in Google Drive and link in the chat. There will be the workflow and the information. You're welcome to that. Uh, if you have any issues getting into that, please let me know and I will share it. It's too large to be able to um, email it to everyone, but I could even, if you need me to do a file mail or something, I can do that. Uh, Agisoft does have a 30-day free trial if you wanted to play around with it and the educational license if you buy it. Um, and you have the, to get the educational license, you just have to have a .edu email address. And I don't even think they like ask too many questions. You just have to like type it in. Um, and without the educational license, it does get more expensive. Um, and there's a standard and a professional and the standard license will do all of the modeling that we have just described. The professional lets you integrate other data sources and geo-reference things and put in LIDAR and like all sorts of other data. So, you know, you're fine to start with just the professional or the, sorry, the standard. Um, and I think you can even update your, upgrade your standard license to the professional, you know, not, you know, so it's like, a little cheaper to it's the same amount at the end but they like discount you what you've already paid if you upgrade yeah and the guys at Agisoft are really <laughs> great uh and if you get into this and you have issues and you start googling you'll find out that Agisoft the community support pages have a lot of resources and information out there and there's a gentleman who works for Agisoft his name is Alexi either there are multiple Alexis or Alexi is is just on it constantly on the just, uh it's just like forms. siri or yeah alexa that's just what you call the people there it's a russian company so yeah so constantly on the forums he's the one who will email you back if you have weird questions um but yeah that's it any questions